uh, <clears throat> so what we've uh, what we've seen so far is I, I, I went over the um, uh, uh, some some introduction to try and motivate this um, uh, new approach to solving uh, two point initial boundary value problems on the finite level um, by analogy to methods that we know for um, similar problems, um, and then I gave uh, this uh, very sort of broad and not necessarily uh, clear. Um, a uh, description of the three stages of the method. So I've just written uh, on the side a reminder of stage one and stage two. Um, the idea for this lecture is to go through stage one and um, some at least of stage two. I don't think we'll get to stage three, so I haven't written that down, um, in a particular example. Okay, uh, so uh, the example that um, I'd like to study uh, is this one. So I want to study the finite interval uh, inhomogeneous uh, Dirichlet problem for the heat equation. Um, and I'm picking this one um, partly because it's a problem we already know how to solve, so we can see the solution representation that we're going to get. Um, and we're going to see, uh, uh, well, we, we could at least, if we wanted to, see how it matches up with solution representations that you could obtain classically. Um, you can also see whether you think this method is easier or harder for, than, um, uh, than, the, than the classical separation of variables approach, um, which, remembering, because we have inhomogeneous boundary conditions, is not quite as straightforward. You've got to subtract off some long time limit, and that's not necessarily entirely trivial. Um, uh, but uh, also because uh, being second order, that just means there's less notation appearing everywhere all over the board. Um, it's not any uh, less mathematically complex than the uh, other examples, um, but it's uh, notationally a little um, less uh, arduous. Uh, so, so to be absolutely clear about the problem I'm interested in, it's this one. Heat equation. Uh, on a finite interval uh, with an initial condition for some known initial datum Q naught uh, and uh, two boundary conditions um, at the left will have some uh, boundary datum G naught, and at the right, we'll have boundary datum G1. Okay, um, where uh, each of these three data are appropriately smooth, as smooth as we need them to be, um, we might want them to be uh, C infinity. Um, uh, as I said, I'm not going to really worry about the regularity in these talks. Okay. So uh, let's start off with some preliminary work before we uh, actually. Um, start on stage one. Um, so how does the Fourier transform um, interact with um, the second derivative operator on this finite interval? Oh, sorry, I should say smooth functions on the finite interval. Well, we really very much saw how to do this yesterday. The only difference is I'm just going to put a minus sign in here now um, for notational convenience. Um, so this is minus integral from 0 to 1 e to the minus i lambda x uh, phi double prime of x dx 
which integration by parts twice tells us is uh, phi prime of zero plus i lambda phi of zero minus e to the minus i lambda phi prime of one plus i lambda phi of one uh, plus lambda squared phi hat of lambda. Now last time we saw something like this when we tried to do the um, uh, the homogeneous Dirichlet heat problem on the half line, we, uh, well, we, we didn't have this bit, firstly, but then we said, oh, well, that looks like it's going to give us too difficult a um, ODE, and gave up and looked for a, the Fourier sign transform instead. Well, my, uh, my pitch here is that we were a bit hasty there. It's, more, it's a more difficult ODE, sorry, I said PDE, I meant too difficult an ODE in time, and we gave up. Well, my pitch is that this is going to give us a more difficult ODE, but not a too difficult ODE. We can still solve it. Um, so, let's have a go. Stage one. So we are going to begin by assuming there exists a function Q on the right domain, uh, as smooth as we need, up to the boundaries. Uh, and we're going to assume that it satisfies both the PDE and the initial condition. Um, so we are not at any stage, sorry, we're not at any, in any part of stage one going to use the boundary conditions at all. Just going to use these two, okay? Um, okay. So if we make that assumption and then um, apply the uh, Fourier transform to the PDE, what do we get? So we get zero is. This, which, after a little bit of work and using this information, we get that this is um, DDT plus lambda squared applied to Q hat. The lambda squared is coming from here. Um, plus. A bunch of other terms. And now you see why I wanted to do a second order PDE, because otherwise we'd have more of these terms and we'd all get sick of me writing them out. Okay. Uh, So then, if we just sort of try and go forward, the next step when we, when we had a uh, Fourier transform method was to solve this ODE, right? Well, let, let's have a go at that. Let's solve in inverted commas. Um, well, this is the integrating factor that we saw Tom use. So we get zero is e to the lambda squared t uh, q hat of lambda t minus the initial uh, value plus. Well, okay, so what I did here is I multiplied by e to the lambda squared t in here so that this operator just turns into a ddt. Uh, but that means I need to multiply all the other things by e to the lambda squared t as well. Um, uh, except then I'm going to integrate um, from zero up to t these things. So if I do that, uh, I'll 
I get this. Okay, uh, except this term is just this by the initial condition. All right. Uh, So now, um, to slightly abbreviate this notation, um, we're going to introduce uh, some uh, convenience, which is this function. OK, so this guy is the integral from 0 up to t, e to the lambda squared s, jth spatial derivative q at x s ds. So that encapsulates all of these four terms. fj, sorry, yeah, my f's are, look bad. They're all going to look like that. Get used to it. <laughs> it's, it's not going to get better. Um, OK. Uh, all right, so, so now I'm just going to make this substitution and this, uh, this notational substitution. Um, and we get uh, rearranging this equation slightly. Um, Q0 hat of lambda minus e to the lambda squared t Q hat of lambda t uh, is I lambda F0 of lambda 0 t um, plus F1 of lambda 0 t uh, minus e to the minus i lambda i lambda F0 of lambda 1 t um, plus F1 of lambda 1 t. Okay, so the, the thing to remember here is that um, the subscript denotes um, the, deriv the derivative, whether it's a Dirichlet or a Neumann uh, boundary value that we're interested in, and this, um, this parameter tells you whether it's at the left or at the right, OK? Uh, OK, now this, is, uh, this equation is uh, valid for all complex lambda. Um, and it's also valid for all t um, that makes sense. And this equation is important. In fact, it is the global relation that I promised you in uh, um, part two of stage one. Okay, so indeed we have. Um, if we look at our uh, our space-time domain, uh, not quite right. We look at our space-time domain. Um, then, on this rectangle, we've got this one is a transform along this boundary. This one is a transform along this boundary. This one is a transform along here, um, and so is this one. And then these two are transforms along here. So that really is doing what I promised the global relation would do. OK. Well, we're also going to use this equation to produce the Aaron Price form. So remember, the Aaron Price form, we want to get an equation for Q of xt involving some other terms. Well, this is just the Fourier transform of Q of xt. So let's make it the subject 
and apply the inverse Fourier transform, right? Uh, right, so yeah, if we do that all in one go, we get that um, twice pi q of xt is integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the i lambda x minus lambda squared t um, q naught hat of lambda d lambda. So that's this term, but I've had to divide by e to the lambda squared t, which is where this part comes from, and then I've got the Fourier kernel, as we expect. Uh, and I've just multiplied everything by 2 pi to put the 2 pi on this side instead of having to write it lots of times. Um, but then, of course, there's all the other terms as well. Uh, so that's minus integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the i lambda x minus lambda squared t times um, i lambda f0 of lambda 0t um, plus f1 of lambda 0t uh, d lambda plus integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the i lambda x minus 1 now minus lambda squared t i lambda f0 of lambda 1t plus f1 of lambda 1t. Okay. Um, now, I've been a little bit, i played a little bit fast and loose with the Fourier transform here, right? Because firstly, I've applied the Fourier transform to both sides of an equation, sorry, the inverse Fourier transform. I pl applied the inverse Fourier transform to both sides of the equation. Um, and uh, inverse Fourier transform, unless we're dealing with um, perfectly smooth functions, there really ought to be a Cauchy principal value going on here, right? Um, at best, right? Maybe you actually need to think in terms of um, uh, some, some smooth cutoff functions. Um, well, I said I wanted everything to be smooth, but Q0 is smooth on a finite interval. After that, we've extended by zero. So there's a jump here, right, in general, right? So actually, Q0 as a function on the real line is not a smooth function. Um, so, so really, this, this formula is it's kind of wrong, actually. It should be Cauchy principal values. Um, but it's going to turn out later on that you can get rid of those. Um, so uh, I'm not going to bother writing them every time. OK? Um, Secondly, I've split this, um, this integral over three parts of the integrand. Um, again, that's something that you can justify um, rigorously when you go through it. Um, but uh, in principle, at this stage, we should be thinking of these three integrals as a single Cauchy principal value limit of integrals. Okay? Um, trust me, it's going to work out later in the end. So uh, I'm, I'm not cheating. Okay. Uh, oh, of course, this formula is not going to hold at x equals, or we can't really expect it to hold at x equals 0 and x equals 1, necessarily, because, as I said, there was a discontinuity at x equals 0 and x equals 1. Um, so this really only holds in the interior of the spatial domain. But you can take a limit from the interior to get the boundary points, at least, right? OK. Um, so this is not yet the RM price form. I want to do a little bit more. So we're going to deform uh, the latter two contours of integration uh, away from the real line. Right? I'm going to leave this one where it is, but these two I don't like. Um, 
it's not reasonable for you to see why I don't like them yet, but it will become clear significantly later on. Okay. Um, in order to do that, uh, we need some definitions. Uh, so this is the C plus and minus is the upper and lower open half planes. Uh, D is the part of the plane where lambda squared is negative, sorry, the open part of the plane for that. Um, and E is the part of the plane where the real part of lambda squared is positive. Okay, so um, these, these ideas of C plus and minus and D and E are kind of encoded in the behavior of this exponential function, right? That's, that's really what I'm trying to um, describe by these things. Um, and then we're going to want the intersections of these as well. So this is D intersect C plus and minus and E plus and minus is E intersect C plus and minus. Um, and then these are all um, nice simple sectors of the complex plane. So we're going to orient the boundaries um, uh, in the positive sense. Uh, and there's just about space for a diagram. So this is D plus, this is D minus, um, this is E plus, and this is E minus. So yeah, I should have said these are not necessarily sectors, but unions of sectors at least. Uh, and that's pi by four, and that's three pi by four. Okay, so what I'm going to aim to do eventually is um, deform this contour onto, so from the real line to the boundary of D plus and the other one to the boundary of D minus. So, uh, right, I'll leave that up. So in order to do that, I'm going to need tools. Um, and the tools are Cauchy's integral theorem, um, which says that if u is open and simply connected in the complex plane, and f from u to complex is holomorphic um, on u, and gamma is a simple closed curve in U, then the integral around gamma is zero. Yeah, sorry. So where Tom used capital gamma to represent the contour, I'm using lowercase gamma, even though Tom used that to represent the parameterization. Um, uh, and then the other thing we need is Jordan's lemma. And Jordan's lemma says that if V is open in the complex plane um, and for all 
R positive, V intersect, all centered at zero. Radius R is the union of finitely many simply connected uh, regions. Uh, let the contour CR plus or minus be um, Yes. Um, B circle centered at zero, zero radius R intersect V intersect C plus or minus. And if F from the closure of V to complex is continuous, with, and this is the um, criterion that we're really going to have to check, um, the limit as the maximum of f of lambda on, ah, sorry, this is why I wrote it this way. So, CR, I really want to think when I'm thinking of it as a set, it really does matter that it's the closure of this, so it includes the endpoints, okay? Um, so the maximum of f of lambda on this contour um, has limit zero as r goes to infinity, the radius of the circle increases. Um, then, for all A positive, limit as R goes to infinity of integral around, uh, sorry, integral along this um, uh, contour that's made up of some circular arcs of E to the plus or minus I A lambda, F of lambda is zero. Okay, so this is a slightly, slightly generalized version of um, lemma. Um, that's uh, going to be more convenient for us uh, because Jordan's lemma, typically you'd be talking about a, a circular arc like this, right, in the whole of the upper half plane. Well, I only want it to be in this bit and this bit. So really all of that notational mess is, is, is in order to, to, to make sense of just this bit and just this bit. Or sometimes we might want it on just this bit, right? That's all I'm saying here. Okay. Uh, so a corollary, um, which we get just from putting these two together, is under a certain criterion, Um, the integral along here is equivalent to the integral along here, okay? So, uh, we're saying if f from u to the complex numbers um, analytic, um, uh, and you open simply connected um, set that contains the closure of V. Uh, and f of lambda goes to zero uniformly in the argument of lambda as lambda goes to infinity within 
closure of V, and the uniformly in the argument is about this maximum, right? This is just a, an alternative language for this same concept. Uh, where are we? Then, the limit as R goes to infinity of integral around boundary of V intersect ball radius zero, sorry, radius R center zero um, intersect C plus and minus um, of E to the plus or minus I lambda A F of lambda D lambda. That limit is zero and this works um, for all a positive. Okay. So I'm saying that that's a bad choice. I'm saying that if we take this contour and this contour, we um, integrate around those contours, and then we take the limit as our r goes to infinity, we get zero, okay? Which is precisely the same as this, sorry, this integral is the same as this integral, okay? Uh, in particular, um, we apply uh, the corollary um, with V is E uh, and I guess U is the upper or lower half plane um, uh, so that second and third uh, integral along the real line can be replaced uh, with an integral along boundary of D minus, sorry, boundary of D plus um, uh, or boundary of D minus, respectively. Uh, Dave? Yes. That's a question. So in, in doing this, what, what you're looking at is the analyticity properties of which function there? Um, so the F in the corollary is e to the minus lambda squared T I lambda, well, and then this times this parenthetical part. Okay? Um, so I'm looking at analyticity and boundedness of it. Um, so I haven't actually justified those yet, but that's, that's the next step. Okay? Um, but yeah, it's going to work. Yes? So with that, that limit, is, is it not true that that inter integral for every finite r is zero, just by Cauchy's theory? Because it's the boundary of v intersects the ball Um, right, uh, yeah, that's true in this case because, uh, right, I haven't written this properly, have I? But, but if you just put the boundary onto the V. I think. Isn't that what you want? Like that? Yeah. 
Yes, that's exactly what I want. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave this formula here. So we need to justify um, analyticity and um, decay of uh, the relevant part of the integram, which is all apart to the i lambda x, because that's going to be this bit. Uh, and um, note that the analyticity is um, is easy because these are just um, integrals of uh, integrable functions, right? So this is, this is definitely an analytic function. It's, a, it's an integral from, uh, from, uh, from 0 up to t. So it's a finite integral. So this is an analytic function of lambda. Um, so for the, uh, for the decay, we're going to um, integrate by parts in S, e to the minus lambda squared t, fj of lambda xt. This is an integral from 0 to t, e to the minus lambda squared t minus s, uh, jth partial derivative of q of x s. Uh, so when we integrate by parts, we get lambda to the minus 2 e to the minus lambda squared t minus s, jth partial derivative q of x s. Minus um, lambda to the minus two integral from zero to t. Uh, I'm going to write that on the next line. E to the minus lambda squared t minus s dt uh, dxj q of x s ds. Okay, um, now, um, in just the same way as, uh, as, as, uh, as Tom suggested, you can use a, a, a riemann obeig lemma to say that this, is this part of this integral is decaying. Um, and this goes like, uh, so, so that means that the whole thing uh, goes like um, order lambda to the minus two. Um, and this works uniformly in the argument of lambda as lambda goes to infinity, um, provided we're only caring about what's happening within the closure of E. Okay, so if we're within, let's take this, this sector of E plus, right? Um, so if we square those numbers, that's the first quadrant. Um, then we're multiplying by t minus s, which is a, uh, a positive or sorry, a non-negative number. And then we're multiplying by minus one. So the first, so so this sector is mapped to the third sector, uh, to the third quadrant. Um, so it has negative. Uh, or non-positive real part, so uh, so that means that um, uh, this guy is at worst oscillatory. Okay, um, and and the same argument's going to work for each of these. Okay. Uh, So that means that this, this part of the integrand um, 
is uh, order lambda to the minus one, now because we've got a lambda multiplying this bit, um, uniformly in the argument of lambda, uh, everywhere in E plus, um, and really this one everywhere in E minus. Well, actually, I guess it's true um, in all of E for both of those, but the next part is uh, going to be in only E plus and E minus. Um, Okay, so that means that the first integral, sorry, I apologize, the second integral of um, this equation, that's this integral, uh, can be written as this, um, which is then just this. Um, and you can do something with something similar with the other one. So this is um, minus the integral from plus infinity to infinity, which is minus the integral from plus infinity to, sorry, plus infinity to minus infinity, I mean, plus infinity to minus infinity minus um, integral around boundary E minus, uh, which is then integral around boundary D minus. Sorry, minus integral around boundary D minus. So what we've shown here is that we can just change these integrals, change the contours rather of these integrals like this. Okay, um, so this, uh, this kind of contour deformation um, is uh, essentially um, allowed by Jordan's lemma, right? That, that's all we've used here. Um, you can also make a finite contour deformation, and sometimes we'll have to, um, just using Cauchy's integral theorem. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go through this argument in such great detail every time. I'll just say it's a finite contour deformation. That means you use Cauchy's integral. Uh, you, that means you know you have to use um, Cauchy's integral theorem. And if it's a um, infinite contour deformation, if there's some kind of uh, deformation going on over a whole sector, then that means you have to use Jordan's lemma in basically this way. You just gotta decide exactly which bit, you're, uh, which bit of the integrand you're getting um, your uh, decay from. Uh, okay, so we've now arrived at this Aaron Price form. Um, and of course, this only worked for A positive, which means that we're only allowed to make this contour deformation for X positive here and X less than one here. But this formula before we made the deformation only was right for X in the open interval, so we haven't actually lost anything. Um, so this is uh, our um, what I'm going to call the Aaron Price form for T. Okay. 
and uh, we can uh, we can extend this a little bit because using really exactly the same argument, we can make a contour deformation over um, over d plus, right? So this time we're going to close our contour um, over d plus to, to nothing. What's the uh, integrand that I want to do that with? Well, I want to um, I want to replace these t's by any number bigger than t. Okay, so um, let's write. Um, A similar argument for all TAF greater than T, e to the minus lambda squared T times I lambda integral from T up to TAF, um, e to the lambda squared S Q of XS, the S plus integral from T up to TAF, e to the lambda squared S um, times the Neumann boundary value. Yes, um, that's also order lambda to the minus one um, uniformly in the argument of lambda um, as Lambda goes to infinity within the closure of D. So that means that I can add this bit into this integrand, right? And similarly, this one. And if you look at what these integrals are, well, this is going from T up to TAF, whereas this integral was just stopping at T, and similarly this one, right? So that means that actually um, I can replace this T by TAF, this T by TAF, this T by TAF, this T by TAF, and I get another version of the Aaron Price form, which I'll call the Aaron Price form for TAF. Okay, um, and that works, I want to remind you, for all TAF greater than T. Okay? Okay, why, why would I want to do that? Well, I'd want to do that because um, this integral, um, the, the original version with T's, we've got a sort of complicated T dependence, right? Because there's a t-dependence in here, and there's also t-dependence in these um, transforms, right? In these um, integrals. Whereas if we put TAF up here, then instead um, we've got a, a very simple uh, dependence on t, um, which might make it better for numerical calculations, possibly. Um, I guess it's not going to be that much good for um, asymptotics, because, of course, TAF is going to have to grow with t. But... Um, at least for numerics, it might be better. So we've now completed stage one. Um, so we started by assuming a solution exists. And we only used the assumption that it satisfies the PDE and the initial condition so far, right? So that means that if we had different boundary conditions, we can just reuse all of this work, right? We don't have to do it again, which is nice. Um, so we found it must satisfy The global relation um, and the Aaron Price form for TAF. 
Now, the value of the global relation is not exactly clear, except in order to derive this. Um, it's going to become clear in a minute. Because um, let's, let's, let's think about what we have in this formula. Well, this is a formula for the solution of the problem, which is what we ultimately want to find. It involves what? The Fourier transform with the initial datum. We know what that is. That's, that's good. We're happy with that. It also involves transforms of the four boundary values, the Dirichlet, uh, the Dirichlet boundary value at the left, Neumann boundary value at the left, the Dirichlet boundary value at the right, and the Neumann boundary value at the right. If we look ahead to what we're going to do in stage two, we only have the Dirichlet at the left and the Dirichlet at the right. Okay? So we only know this one and this one. We don't know these two. So that means that this is not an effective representation of the solution yet. Right? We can't actually just plug this into a computer and plot it yet. Um, So because two of the boundary values are unknown, um, we can't yet um, uh, claim that we've solved the problem. Um, so this is why we need, um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this instance, we need a um, Dirichlet to Neumann map, right? We heard about those yesterday. That was given your Dirichlet boundary values as, as data of the problem, produce the Neumann boundary values, right? Well, actually, we don't need to do quite as much as that because what we really want to do is, given our Dirichlet boundary values, produce these spectral transforms of the Neumann boundary values, right? And that's actually a lot easier, it's going to turn out. So that's why um, people talk about this as not necessarily a Dirichlet and Neumann map, but as a spectral Dirichlet and Neumann map. We're going to exploit the information we have in the spectral plane to make the problem easier. We'll see how to do this tomorrow. Okay? Um, but then if you think about like, how we can extend this method to other problems, well, one could just as well have specified the Neumann values here, and then we'd need a Neumann to Dirichlet map. Or we could have specified a Rabin condition at each end, and then we'd need a Rabin to Dirichlet and Neumann map, right? Because whatever boundary conditions we specify, we still need all of these four boundary values. Right? Well, this starts to get a bit confusing um, from a, a nomenclature point of view because once we get up to problems of higher spatial order, we run out of um, Frenchman's names. So this is why people tend to call it a, uh, a generalized spectral Dirichlet to Neumann map. I'm sick of arguing about this, so I'm calling it a data to Neumann map. Okay? Sorry, I apologize. A data to unknown map. Um, because these four, or at least some of these four, are unknowns, and we always have data. Okay? So we'll, we'll implement that process in stage two, uh, and we'll do that um, tomorrow. Uh, but before I finish, I just want to advertise for the um, uh, problem set, what are we calling them? Um, the working sessions this afternoon? Discussion sessions, thank you. Uh, for the discussion sessions, um, uh, let's, uh, let's try um, 
changing the PDE um, and see if we can pull all of this through. Okay? So I hope lots of people will show up and we can have working groups and work, in, uh, work on different PDEs and see if we can get this all to work. Okay, thanks very much. It always possible to find this Dirichlet Neumann map? Um, so it, it turns out that at least in the setting that we're doing here with, um, I, I guess I'm thinking about your, um, your uh, boundary conditions are um, in terms of uh, linear two-point boundary forms, right? Um, so they're uh, linear combinations of the function and its first n minus one derivatives, if that's an nth derivative. Um, evaluated at the left and the right, um, and you have n boundary conditions and they are linearly independent, right? These are reasonable assumptions, yeah? Um, uh, it turns out the problem is well posed if and only if uh, you can do that, um, at least at the spectral level, yeah. Um, the, the proof of that is not something I'm going to cover, but uh, or the, uh, yeah, the, the, the only if, um, sorry, the, the if I'm not going to. Any other questions? Uh, in the case of uh, mixed derivatives, the entire procedure would go through? Sorry, can you speak up a little? In the case of mixed derivatives, uh, in time and space, the entire process would just go through? The case of mixed der Oh, like you have a um, DXT in here, sure. Um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, well, Vishal uh, wrote the first paper on, on how to do this, I think. Um, so, uh, do, you, do you want to comment? I mean, yes, it's certainly the short answer. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Uh, I, okay, I might qualify a little more than that. Um, <laughs> there's uh, your... Um, the definition of your Ds and Es is... Um, a little bit more complicated, um, and you have to be um, a little bit more careful because um, uh, this is going to, or like the, the coefficients here that are currently i lambda and 1 are going to be uh, ratios of polynomials now, um, and that makes... Uh, uh, that makes it, you can, you can certainly do it for Y classes, but it hasn't been proven exactly that you can do it and how to do it for all such um, uh, uh, problems. Um, I, I would be very surprised if it turns out there's a problem, but it hasn't been proved conclusively. And, and there's a, a recent work of Gino Biondini, which um, I understand is coming to the archive in uh, the next few days, um, where they look at a similar problem to, uh, was your work with, was it just you and De Konink? Yeah. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a, you get, a, you get different, um, different meromorphic coefficients here, and they have a, a harder time dealing with it. So there's some reason to be a little cautious. They're able to do it, but it's harder. <laughs>